to ask you some questions about your life experience. We've known each other now for at least 15 years. Mm. We've been colleagues for 10, and you have become one of the most important and famous geographers in America, and well-known <laughs> overseas as well. So today I'd like to explore a little of your own personal side of this story, what the inner journey has been, what the important experiences have been in your career. I'd like you to take it up just where you please. Ah, hmm. I was born in. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was born in Brooklyn. I've lived a third of my life in New York City. There are two kinds of New Yorkers. Only two. Really only two. Uh, the overwhelming majority either never leave or if they leave, they constantly pine to return. Uh -huh. And I'm one of the small minority that couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> and uh, it's a nice town to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Uh -huh. And um, so I spent a third of my life in New York, a third in the Midwest, and a third in New England. And we'll probably spend all the rest of my days in New England. So your life is divided in three parts. <laughs> but with uh, some overseas experience, experience. thrown in. Yes. yes. From that early New York experience, what do you remember as being most significant? What made you want to get out of New York, for example? Um, hmm, that's, that's, uh, uh, well, there's kind of unreality to, to New York. I, I, I think in lots of ways, I, uh, uh, I never heard of geography until I took my first geography course, like so many other uh, American geographers. I think it's such a common yes. tale. And um, but I discovered that in many ways I was a closet geographer all my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, uh, uh, I explored New York City as a child. I used to go off as an eight-year-old. I used to go off on the subway train uh, on every Saturday and go to some point of interest and walk around and. Uh, I knew, knew New York City uh, spatially, geographically, very well. Um, and uh, I was a Boy Scout and uh, <clears throat> discovered that there was a world of nature that one could explore as well. Do you think in that early year, those early years, you got a love for nature as an alternative to the city? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even though we didn't have much exposure, because mm -hmm. uh, our big nature exposure was to go to Staten Island. <laughs> Peach? <laughs> <laughs> no, we hiked in uh, some uh -huh. parks there. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. so, but what, from your early childhood experience, I mean, what were the things you valued, the things you found were thrilling, you know, of your early years, besides taking the subway around the city and going to Staten Island? What were the things you really enjoyed doing? Um, I did a lot of fantasy. Mm -hmm. I had a pretty miserable childhood. Would you like to describe no. some of that? Okay. <laughs> used to fantasy. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to construct imaginary worlds. It was pretty mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Do you remember some of those? Mm. Mm. I uh, often built on novels. I did enormous amount of reading. Um, I read, probably read all of Dumas by the time I was 12. Uh -huh and uh, my teeth on Robert Louis Stevenson. Mm -hmm. So I often extrapolated myself to the time, so I know I was one of D'Artagnan's sidekicks. <laughs> <laughs> but it was in reading. You didn't get involved with drama groups or No, it was, a very, it's, uh, it was very personalized, very long. Uh, Mostly uh, in bed before I went to bed. Aha, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see. That's very interesting. Uh, in school in New York, you, you obviously went to grade school and high school in New York. Yes. Yes. Do you remember anything from those years that were important? Well, I got out very early. That's one that I think that's probably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I got out of high school when I was uh, still not quite 16. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. with me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You as well? Yes. Yeah. And, and um, uh, I just found out that Gilbert White got out quite early. As well, well, maybe we have a new case of the same. That's great. Now, these times in New York must have been 
difficult times. This would be yes, late the, 30s. Yes, the Depression had a very, yes. we, we, were, we were quite poor. Yes. My father died uh, just about when I was born. And we had a very, very hard time. So I'm a real Depression baby, and I think it's marked me yes. in many ways for the rest of my life. You think those who were born just then were, had a very different experience than those who were in their teens, say. Yeah. Remember in our discussion with Kevin Lynch, he glorifies the 30s. He was a teenager, and uh, he, for him it was a great moment of idealism and so on. Yeah, I, I think there is a difference. Uh, um, uh, clearly, for example, I, I've just been doing some work with Gilbert, and, and uh, uh, the, he, who went as a 22-year-old to take part in the New Deal. Uh -huh. and, and there's even a further step of, of what Kevin Lynch is trying to yes. do. Uh, I remember oatmeal and prunes for, as a mainstay of my eating for eight or nine years. The Depression didn't end for us until uh, World War II. Uh -huh. yeah. My goodness. Yeah. And you were in New York all this time, were you? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. When did you move to the Midwest? I moved to the Midwest in 48. Um, uh, uh, I dropped out of college. Uh, my wife, I met, m met my wife. She dropped out of college. And uh, she had been going to Indiana University. Mm -hmm. And we decided to uh, leave New York and go to work. And so we picked a place that uh, she knew about from her fellow students at Bloomington. Uh -huh. Bloomington. And we moved yeah. to Indiana, we moved to Cary, Indiana. Two places students went to work and who went to Indiana University. They either went to work in General Motors and in Anderson, Indiana, or they went to work in the Steelworks in Gary. Gary, so we went to Gary. You chose the Steelworks? Yeah. yeah. What kind of work were you doing there? Oh, I worked in the uh, uh, rolling mill. I was a kind of a skilled, uh, 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 skilled gang leader in respect to quality. I measured great big slabs of steel with calipers and made sure they were the right size. So on. Oh, for how many years did you? Work? I worked all told, I think, about thirteen years. Huh. And then went back to college. I went back to college in my eleventh uh, year, I think. Uh huh in the middle. I, I worked through my master's degree. How come you valued uh, no, knowledge so much? I mean, you here with, a, with no, all I didn't this value other knowledge all that much. Well, first of all, I had a basic value for knowledge. I always read, and in, in that's in, in, in some sense. It wasn't a, even a question of valuation. It was a question that it was um, a kind of way of life to, to, to read, think, and so on. Um, uh, what I actually did, though, I wanted to become a primary school teacher. And the reason I wanted to become a primary school teacher was I discovered camping. Mm -hmm. And in 1955, I think, I remember because our tent had stenciled on it, 1955, I discovered um, camping. And we went on our first long camping trip on our summer vacation. Uh, my youngest child then was uh, nine months old, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. And I came across uh, in various state parks people who were the park naturalists, uh -huh. and they were invariably usually primary school teachers who had a summer job. And it just seemed to me that was an ideal way to spend the summer. So That's I decided <laughs> I was going to become a primary <laughs> school teacher, so I'd have a summer off. <laughs> There's a colleague of yours in France who had a similar really? <laughs> reason for wanting to become a geographer, so yeah. that he could have summer excursions yeah. Yeah. on bicycle yeah. or camping. And the tragedy is that having done that, I've never had a summer off since then. <laughs> Are we getting to the contradictions? <laughs> so, primary school teaching. Did, yeah. you, ever, did you seriously then take up a course at the Yes, university? I went to night school. I, entered, yeah. I, I had some college, you know, I dropped out of college. I had about two years. Um, um, uh, and in, in, in effect, I had a pattern that's very commonplace now. For mm -hmm. all my children have all been, uh, have had interrupted educations and late bloomers and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But that time was relatively rare. Um, uh, um, so I, I dropped out of uh, 
college to get married and raise a family. And uh, then when I went back and I started back in night school and uh, I got some good advice from an advisor. They said, well, take something easy, but something that's also required. At that time, geography was required. Geography and conservation were required uh -huh. for primary school teachers in the state of Indiana. I see. <laughs> and the uh, mm -hmm. people who taught the geography and conservation course uh -huh. were um, graduate students from the University of Chicago who made a living coming out uh, 40 miles uh -huh. to the to these uh, industrial Stokes. suburbs yes. to teach the poor benighted who lived in <laughs> um, Gary, Indiana. And um, uh, my teacher, uh, um, uh, then who I don't, I don't think we had, uh, uh, um, played a very important role in, in encouraging me to go on. And she made the possible for me to, uh, to, oh, I think she played the key role in, in, um, uh, encouraging me to give up wanting to be a primary school teacher to raise my sights professional mm -hmm. geography. Do you remember her name? Um, Wasn't Edith Park? No. No. That's important, I think, because you've continued that interest, even though you're an urban person, you know. And I would expect you to have urban type interests in geography. Actually, you are interested in natural resources. You're interested in the rural environment. You're interested in in those questions that I think a, a country person ought to be interested in. Have you ever thought about that sort of uh, contradiction in one way? You're, it's not from your experience that you've gained your That's interest right. in That's geography. Right. It's from some inspiring teacher who got you involved with. Involved well, but it is in some sense. I had, as a steel worker, for example, I'm looking back and thinking about being a closet geographer, I had read every book on, and it goes back to the fantasy as a child, I'd read every book on climbing Everest uh -huh. they said, uh -huh. that had been written. Uh, I was very much taken. Hillary uh, uh -huh. climbed Everest, and I read all of the books on the attempts and so on, purely an armchair uh -huh. thing. And I did that just just for recreation uh -huh. or reading. They said. Uh -huh. So I think that 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 um, combination of, of a, essentially an urban person but with a strong interest in nature just mm -hmm. just is a very uh, common thing and I think in my own professional work I've essentially put that together yes yes that's it's, very uh, interesting yeah. yes because that's the period when all geographers or most geographers in America with the exception of very few were not interested in the natural world yes and and, and, and when I went to yeah. Chicago to, I had it when White was chairman of the department and he interviewed me. So I showed up with the kids and my wife. This was a momentous decision if I would change our lives and I figured everybody ought to get yeah. in on the decision <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, he wasn't particularly encouraging. He, uh, he was uh, uh, cautious, very cautious, as I would be, I think, in a similar situation somebody like me mm -hmm. and um, And he suggested that I uh, read the, over the summer, uh, I, the, towards the spring of the semester, and over the summer, he suggested I read the journals and see what I'm interested in, because I had no exposure to professional geography. Um, uh, one of the funny things was, as I stepped out, uh, um, I didn't know what a journal was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't admit that. Yes, you did. <laughs> I played it cool. You thought it was something like the Wall Street. I asked someone, yeah, yeah, I asked someone what was a journal. <laughs> and I got, anyway, so I took home this, this stack of geographical reviews and um, annals, yeah. <clears throat> and I read through them, and it was very obvious that I had a real preference, mm -hmm. and I read the articles on water, I read the articles on natural resources, I read the articles on conservation. Um, I didn't know at the time that that, that, that necessarily was White's field or anything mm -hmm. like that, but those were the articles I was interested in. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was very, very telling, you yes. see. And, it's, and when I came back to see him in there just before the semester started, I reported that. You see. So, well, interesting. <laughs> why, why did you, you know, we talked about it. And so, 
So they accepted me on probation. There was a very remarkable um, thing about uh, that Chicago still has, although a few schools, I guess other schools now have, which, uh, and which anticipated what developing countries would have, which was to, um, to appreciate late bloomers. Mm -hmm. And as a, I think a carryover, really, the Hutchins era, that they had in small print, the University of Chicago, that a graduate department could take you without ever finishing college uh -huh. if you were over 25 and had lived, had some mm -hmm. life experience. So this was a, a forerunner of the attempts to, I think, to, uh, to yeah, and to credit life experience. Mm -hmm. So they took me on probation. Mm -hmm. And then I had another lucky thing was that, that I had, um, um, uh, my father had fought in World War I, and there was a chunk of money at Chicago available for veterans' children uh -huh. for scholarships, of which there was no one in that in-between generation. The, the, I, I, I was almost unique, and they were just dying to give it away. So that, that provided some money. Once, once I was able to establish uh, myself, that helped a little, mm -hmm. and so on. And so I worked through the master's degree. I, I didn't know, uh, fortunately there was a big strike on, uh, the biggest strike in the steelworkers' history, or longest strike in post-war history, certainly, in which I felt very mixed because all my fellow workers were suffering and, and really feeling the pinch, but I needed it desperately to be able to finish my master's. <laughs> yes, yes. That was, that was <laughs> writing my thesis. <laughs> so I always had this very mixed motivation. And then finally, when I uh, did that, I got enough courage to give up my job. It was difficult, because at the time I was a relatively high-paid worker. I started, uh, in fact, my, fir my uh, first professional job was $1,000 less than my last than my job as a steel worker. Wow. Wow. Here at Clark, yeah. Wow. That's <laughs> something to think about. Oh, but do they? Do you think now Chicago took you in on this philosophy of letting people uh, avail of their own life experience as a base for a professional training? Did you see continuity between your previous work experience and what you actually did? Well, I'm, 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 I was always very grateful for my 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 experience, uh, um, uh, even though there there it wasn't any. Um, um, necessary a direct uh, um, the, the the notion that one can change one's life in significant ways and having done that several times mm -hmm. so, um, it seems to me uh, is is very helpful in coping with a lot of the the confusion between the emotional developmental problems mm -hmm. that so many students have. Um, and their development as, as professionals or within their disciplines. And, and so I had the relative, uh, um, uh, with all my responsibilities on one hand, I still had r relative comfort. Um, I could, uh, I think I enjoyed my education a lot more than, than, than many of my fellow students who, for whom it was always confused, and still is. I mean, it's one of the real problems about teaching, the confusion between tapping in people on a, who are going through a very important personal developmental process mm -hmm. and the confusion with that, with their formal learning, mm -hmm. you know, so on. Uh, and I was with a remarkable class, uh, um, the people like Alan Pred and Roger Casperson and Bill Kelsch and, um, uh, um, and then the class before Ian Burton. It was a very special time and, and uh, uh, that helped a lot. Yeah. Mm. That was a younger generation, I think, than in other graduate schools at the time. In the 50s, I'm told, uh, the graduate students were much older. They weren't just, you know, yes. graduates yeah. from school. Yeah. They were. Yeah. They had been in the war. Yeah. They had been to yeah. Korea and so on. But yours was not a... Sort yeah, well, of I, well I, at 30, I was the oldest, mm -hmm. next to the oldest. There was one man who was older. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were the oldest. Uh, I was the oldest in the class. And, Played a the leader. somewhat uh, well, uh, uh, maybe not the leader, the elder. 
-hmm. might be better. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, yeah. yeah. So now you're in your graduate program, and it's late 50s, beginning 60s. Yeah, 58, I want Yes. And you, you put your whole, uh, your whole thrust is, is oriented toward what Gilbert White, in a way, was doing. Yes. Natural resources, floodplain management, yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah. And that made sense to you. Uh, it seemed a worthwhile direction at that moment. Can yeah. you talk a little bit yeah, about sure. that? Yeah. The, the, um, yeah, there was a very, it was a very um, uh, um, uh, s s sensible line that, that given an interest in natural resources, uh, the, um, let me see how to put this, the uh, American uh, natural resource policy has been dominated actually by hazards. Um, tremendously influenced in, during the 30s by the twin hazards of flood and drought. And much of the uh, s structure of, of policy and formal uh, um, government regulation and, and private response has been influenced by that. So it seemed perfectly natural to, for essentially resource geographers to be studying hazards at that time. It was an easy um, um, switch. And I think in later time we came to realize that, in effect, hazards are the dual of resources. And you know, your yin and yang that you began yes. <laughs> uh, this, this program with, and that uh, um, uh, people encounter hazard in the search for the useful. And I think on a theoretical basis we understand that linkage then, which we didn't really. Mm -hmm. um, um, fully understand, and so that that was that was very very uh, um, natural to do. It was also very natural to um, to come into a situation in which um, one felt a part of a front of of advancing um, knowledge, so that one didn't merely want to make an idiosyncratic uh, or isolated contribution but one could systematically uh, push the front forward. So while a white didn't assign you work on this topic or, or, or that topic, um, there were a dozen topics in the air that knew that were, where the work needed to be done, and one could kind of pick or choose what you thought or what was a natural mm -hmm. for you. Um, being involved all the time in, in, in the process of, of setting that research agenda as well, through seminars, through meetings, uh, and so on. Um, I might just uh, uh, um, try to describe a little bit the general thrust of my work. I've thought about, this is the one thing I thought about in anticipating we were going to have this talk. Um, I think the, the f first of all, the, the, the basic topic that I latched on then, and that, as I said, may have been incipient uh, for a long time, has always been the interface of, I think, where nature, society, and technology come together. Um, uh, and, and so uh, that interaction has always been, uh, whatever the specifics, have always been underlying what I've been interested in. Second feature has been a very strong um, uh, social questioning related to it. I can't think of anything, hardly, that I've worked on uh, well, I can't think of a few things, but, but uh, by and large, almost everything has to have, uh, in my mind, some kind of, of uh, uh, social gain, benefit, or, or interaction to do that. That um, while I think it's perfectly credible and marvelous that people work on um, esoteric subjects, and while I'm strongly committed that basic knowledge can't be advanced simply by a utilitarian thing. I'm fortunate that I'm in an area in which there are enough interesting but also utilitarian questions that one can use that as a test. And so I'd rather put my energies where things will uh, might help. But at the same time, um, the other, uh, other character, which is somewhat paradoxical, is um, I try to choose topics that aren't first order utilitarian, but I like to try to, uh, in effect, do basic research on applied questions, if, yes, if you want. Yes. So I try to go one layer below or <coughs> one generation in advance mm -hmm. yes. um, 
to, to ask a more basic question and, and not to uh, simply try to work on, on what people might call applied geography. Mm -hmm. So while I do apply geography, it's, it's, it's with a much, uh, I try to ask the, uh, uh, um, a somewhat less obvious question. Deeper yeah, deeper or, or in time. So I've mm -hmm. always been interested in, I'm writing a paper on 2048 now. Um, um, uh, okay, uh, uh, I think another feature has been uh, working with other people. Yes, yeah. I noticed yeah. that in your, in your yeah. list of publications. You yeah. do work well with people, evidently. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is, uh, I like it. Yes. I, 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 um, um, I find it a challenge to, to, for the whole to be more than some of its parts mm -hmm. in, in work. Um, and increasingly, I find uh, uh, working on an interdisciplinary basis very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I think I have some skills uh, in 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 doing that. Yes. In, in, mm -hmm. um, uh, Do you think it's easier because of your implicit concern about the? usefulness or the social value of the knowledge. Is that a sort of a bridging theme between you and other disciplines? Yes, but also the, the basic problem orientation, even if it's only an intellectual problem, mm -hmm. it's that one, um, um, and this, this I got very early in my education, mm -hmm. uh, one chooses a, a problem or identifies a problem. First of all, always tries to state it as a problem. Mm, why is something, what is something, you know. Mm -hmm. Where, um, and and then and then you follow that wherever it takes you, yes. and you never once question. Well, is that geography? Is that not geography? You just mm -hmm. take it with it. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need to get the answer, mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and most interesting problems, especially in this interface of nature, society, and technology, um, always lead you everywhere. <laughs> yes, yes, beyond mm -hmm. beyond yeah. the disciplines. Yeah. But there must be something that still provides a common denominator. Uh, so the disciplinarians aren't, in, uh, you know, inclined to fall back on their own disciplinary language. They talk about the problem in a way that makes sense to you. Yeah, well, a lot of, part of that has to be the interpersonal relationships. I think, I think um, um, there's very little genuine interdisciplinary research in the sense that there's lots of research that are uh, six disciplines in search of a common cover. Um, yes. Um, but, but in truly interdisciplinary research, um, everybody changes, mm -hmm. and they don't quite emerge the way they entered. Um, and most of that has to be done, A, by people who like each other, mm -hmm. because there's an enormous amount of trust and, and that has to develop over time. Um, and so uh, one of the things I try to think about is how, to, how do you, what kind of settings lead to to creating that and what kind of settings put that off and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. Can you, can you, when you look back at some of the big projects, for yeah. example, the hazards, the beginning yeah. natural yeah. hazards, uh, would you say, in fact, that it has fulfilled this, this dream of yours, that working together in a cross-disciplinary way, you go through a project together and you come out changed in a way? Uh, do you think that that fulfilled what oh yeah, I, I think there's no question that that I could pick, um, I can name uh, uh, economists, sociologists, and geographers who, uh, psychologists who, um, um, uh, while still maintaining their disciplinary edge, um, if you wanted to, if, if if for example you were putting together a group and you wanted a social scientist to go with an engineer to, to do a, 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 um, an audit of what actually occurred um, at the Naples earthquake, for example. Uh -huh. Any one of them would be quite interchangeable uh -huh. in the sense that they would be sensitized to each of those issues. They would be f f uh, familiar with the fundamental literature. Um, um, they would probably think uh, beyond their discipline as a kind of social scientist. Uh, Within their discipline, they might actually be on the fringes. So the economist would be a, um, would have a strong uh, a Herb Simon type mm -hmm. economics, so mm -hmm. psychology, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's genuinely happened in in in, in that in that mm -hmm. area. Um, 
that's that's really fine. I'd like you to talk about one specific problem area that is is of great concern to you now. You know, pick one of them, whether it's the climate one or the nuclear one. Pick one of those problems and sort of run through what, how you were approaching it, what your hopes are for it. You know. Yeah. Well, I think the one of the latest, most excited thing that I've been uh, most excited and just come to some fruition. Um, has been work on technological hazards. Um, mm -hmm. I actually started work on technological hazards. The first uh, uh, attempt was, uh, uh, was were hazards that were on the border of natural hazards. Actually, the distinction doesn't hold up, as you well know. Difficult to. But yeah, I mean, it's a kind of arbitrary distinction. Um, because the basic essence of all our ideas is that, that things are joint products of nature and society. Mm -hmm. So. But, but um, that was standing, uh, started with a weather modification many years ago, actually, in 1965, I attended my first meeting on weather modification. And we had done some stuff on air pollution, but I'd never gotten fully up until about um, six or seven years ago. Um, I decided, actually, here's where the social responsibility came. I decided that, the, that the re for, for me at least, the important work on natural hazards would be limited to developing countries, because I felt that that's where uh, the real impact of natural hazards happened. That in the United States, it's a kind of gilding the lily situation. We learn to cope fairly effectively, and while there's lots of useful things we could do, I don't see that as major challenges. Uh -huh. um, but I felt for the industrialized countries, it's the technological hazards for which uh, exceed human experience. The key difference was that 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 we can't. Uh, for most natural hazards, you can really depend upon people's common sense mm -hmm. and, and long accumulated experience. Uh, uh -huh. uh, farmers along the Mississippi know as much or more as any of us experts about uh -huh. floods. Uh, mm -hmm. you see, you see. But they don't know about DNA. And, and, and um, um, it seemed to me that this, this was the area in, in which uh, we needed uh, to, to try to do something uh, fundamentally. And I got intrigued with the question of, of um, uh, um, w what to worry about. I, I kind of developed a notion which we kind of laughingly call worry beats theory, which in, 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 in essence, um, it turns out there are three kinds of, of attitudes by scientists to hazards. The, the, there's one attitude which is the count the bodies types. These are um, epidemiologists, if you can't show a dead body, there's no effect, you see. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and the second type is the tip of the iceberg type, which says that um, uh, anything you see, um, there must be a lot more hazard beneath it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, and they, they, they're both quite legitimate points of view, and they both have different evidence, and they have different methods, and they don't, don't talk to each other, they only fight with each other. And then there's a kind of middle of the road group, which I always end up in, yes. <laughs> which 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 says the real problem is to know what to worry about. Uh -huh. You see, and that that's uh, we're short in the society of of the ability to worry and what to worry about. We can't worry about everything. So are there any criteria that we can develop to know which are the big things to worry about, and which to kind of um, let nature take care of itself? <laughs> I mean, you can worry about it if you want to, but you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and, and so I think about society as having a bunch of worry beads, and, which are in relatively short supply. We can increase the size of worry beads. We can have official warriors. Yes. <laughs> and so... That's the National Academy. Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. But there's still a limit. Mm. And in the end, we have to know which bead to rub for which worry. <laughs> and so I got interested in, in... I said, well, what's the most fundamental way um, of dealing with that is is through taxonomy to try to order the range of technological hazards. And it began a very interesting process with a physicist and a geochemist and another geographer and, uh, oh, and a biochemist. Mm -hmm. We sat in my garden in Shrewsbury at the time where I was living and we met every Friday and we worried about how to worry. <laughs> And out of it came a, a, a project where I think I have some answers now. I think we've studied 93 hazards. And we've developed uh, a set of uh, what merge 
is we, we looked at them much of using some of the ways in which people studied cities at one time. What, how a city similar? How are they different? Mm -hmm. Why the urban ecology? Essentially using factor analysis. But, but, but um, coming up with, with uh, five distinct groups of, of worries, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And we can, um, and I think this work, which hasn't been published yet, it's just about to be hopefully published, it's been submitted. Um, I think is, 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 is very exciting. It does provide a scientific basis for at least distinguishing between one hazard and another. And this is an enormous range of hazards from everything from nuclear power to uh, rat poison. I mean, it, it covers the whole spectrum. And in each of those five, there would be an, imp an implied research agenda yeah. as well as policy yeah, that's making right. that's agenda. Right. That's right. Now, on, on these 93, did you look at, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar with it, but uh, did you include this question of human attitudes and the Well, we have a here? parallel, yeah. But we, what we did is we have, we have our, quote, scientific uh -huh. thing, but then we have a completely parallel done by the three psychologists we work with in Eugene Hart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, one of the characteristics of the interdisciplinary work, uh, being at a place like Clark, is we can because we're so small, we can we, we identify people who we feel comfortable with, who may be quite far away, and work jointly with them. And they've been trying to develop a perceived taxonomy, which parallels our, quote, biophysical uh, taxonomy. And we had those. And in fact, we, there's still a third taxonomy we're working with, which is how does society manage those hazards. And, and so we have these in effect three three pictures of, of 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 the same thing now the exciting thing is that the that um uh there are some direct similarities between the perceived and our quote scientific uh, okay. taxonomy and more than that once we teach the qualities of our scientific uh, uh taxonomy to modestly educated people like uh uh, people have had some college, um, they're quite capable of evaluating hazards uh, with, with a surprising degree of success rate. With that, with, our, with kind of with our instructions, they can tap in to a bond of common knowledge and make quite amazing parallel distinctions. So it's very exciting because it means that what we know can also be used and taught by ordinary people, and it doesn't really require you to. In other words, you can, you 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 had the basis of of distinguishing between recombinant DNA and decon rat poison, and it's basically structural characteristics. Even though you don't understand DNA, you just picked up enough general knowledge to do. Are you threatening the expert world? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and the last, uh, I gave a talk on this at MIT and. Somebody came up and said, uh, uh, what the, happens the critic, no, 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 they said, obviously anything that's, that college students can understand at this level is so unsophisticated, it's not worth knowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I suppose, in a way, a trivial kind of uh, response, but what about policy making and the economics of various strategies of technological um, hazard well, management? Well, one of the things that our taxonomy does is it provides you with precedents, and we've just run a little test with um, tampons. Mm -hmm. Tampons, uh, the threat of toxic sh shock syndrome from, the, from women's use of tampons, um, uh, came after we developed our, our set of 93 sample hazards. And what we did is we coded tampons according to our schema, and we were then able to say what it was related to. And it, it's cl most closely related in our set to um, IUDs, the contraceptive IUDs. Um, and it turns out that, that it also has predicted what the policy is. The policy of tampons is almost exactly the same as the policy for IUDs. Oh, it comes down to marketing. <laughs> um, no, no, this is government regulation. Uh -huh. The government regulation response to tampons has been exactly the same as to IUDs. You see, so I think there's some uh, 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 so immediately what happens is, it, is that when a new hazard appears, and there's a hazard of a week roughly, there's a, one new technological hazard appears every two weeks roughly. 
in, in the media and the press and so on. We, we've watched that. Uh, when one appears, uh, a, a hazard manager, say, sitting in a regulatory agency, can at least say, well, what is this similar to, without knowing a great deal about it, with relatively simple things. He can say, mm -hmm. well, he can go into his, his list of precedents and, in effect, sh shunt it into the big pile. Is this a big worry or a little worry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that a developing society now is going to be able to use this information, this taxonomy, to be able to make wise choices about the import of te technology? Yeah, I think they could do that, yeah. and, I, and 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 we're doing some. St we have some mm -hmm. stuff going on, yeah. on on pesticides in particular. Mm -hmm. um, um, but but it's but at this stage, I think it's still uh, uh, dominantly a, a rich person's problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another whole side to your work, Bob, if we could switch gears, yeah, and, sure. and that's the international and the, the national. Yeah. That is, you, you really do have faith in the political process, or you, you seem to have. Uh, you believe that, that there are institutional ways whereby we can solve some of these big problems. Your participation in the National Academy of Science, Arts mm -hmm. and Sciences, your work with the UN agencies, men in the biosphere, and so mm -hmm. on. You, you must obviously have a great deal of confidence in this way of going about research, or, you know. Uh, what is the source of that? No, I have a lot of Credo. skepticism. I don't have a lot of confidence. No? Um, um, uh, I don't think, uh, 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 I, don't, I don't see m many alternatives, I think, is the, is, 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 is the issue. Um, I pick and choose pretty selectively within that, yes. that, that, that matrix that you described um, uh, of, of what to do mm -hmm. and how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, uh, I'm at times overwhelmed with discouragement by the uh, complexity, venality, and every other of, say, the international system um, um, that exists. Uh, um, I find working with the UN agencies uh, always uh, terribly disturbing. My, uh, the, one taps into the worst bureaucracies of 146 nations and so on and so forth. Um, the problem is, is to come up problem is to come up with alternatives mm. and so on. Mm. Um, my solution has always been to at least uh, try to work in a way in which there are at least a dual alternative. So I work within the international um, network of, of science mm -hmm. okay, um, as a non-governmental alternative. And then I try to work through the uh, in a, international agencies as well. Um, uh, if you know something about hazards, as we do, and you feel that it's possible to probably save half the lives that are lost to natural hazards without, without really having to change the society in a fundamental way, and so on, how do you get that message out? First, is it possible? Oh, I, I, oh yes, yeah. it is. It is, it is yes. surely possible, because um, if you applied only what is being used currently mm -hmm. in many developing countries to some of the countries with the worst hazard problems. You won't save all the lives, but you can save half the lives. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in other words, instead of 300,000 people dying from the tropical cyclone in Bangladesh in 1970, perhaps only 150,000 would have died. If you applied what, what uh, is currently good practice in many nations in terms of warning, in terms of evacuation, and so on and so forth. And in nations where you can do that, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to have a, the ideal government or the, or the um, best society to mm -hmm. do that, you see. It, it, much of it is just simply care and attention, some outside help, uh, but a sensitivity not to destroy, of, of, of embedding within a culture. Uh, what what most cultures already know work, <laughs> yeah. and to help them not to forget what that's they right. already that's know. That's right. That's right. Not yes. to destroy mm. the the, mm. the traditional methods, which many of them are mm. very effective, and very powerful. You see, so it's that kind of. Uh, but now, if you have that message, and you really believe that it's possible, you see, not to have the millennium, um, uh, uh, disaster removing the threat of disaster, is one of the first. Uh, uh, things that 
collective action provides for people throughout history. Yes. You see, uh, we may not be able to get rid of day-to-day -day starvation, but we can try to get rid of mass starvation at the same time. Mm -hmm. And some would say, well, that's not much of an advantage, uh, but it's surely historically we can demonstrate that the, the last great subsistence crisis in Europe was in 1816, 1870. Um, we can demonstrate mm -hmm. that. that that, mm -hmm. that so, and yes. certainly from Ireland, yes. Irish history. So we can get rid of that. That's yes. something that's doable. Now, how should one do it? What 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 mechanisms? What network? So so one uses whatever it has. One uses the invisible college of geographers. Yes. It's been very prominent in our work. Yes. Simple the ties that bind us to geographers mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's the most exciting one for me because so many of these so-called disasters can be linked to political fiat. I mean, the one you just referred to was a political decision. You know, food was exported from the country while we were being starved. And yes. there may be others like that. So ultimately, one has to touch the, the political level as well as the resource sure. exploitation level. But the invisible network of geographers, I understand that has been very powerful in many situations, even in Europe, in yeah. East and West, and so on. Are you working to build something like that? Or well, already? clearly we have that in the yes. hazard field. Yes. Yeah. yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 As you look to the future, will you continue to do that kind of thing? Rather? Well, I, I think one thing I want to do is, is uh, um, um, I'd like to do some more things by myself yes. at the moment. Mm -hmm. You have started quite a, a, it's very interesting, you have become reflective and critical in the last year or two. And uh, we have much more to talk about than we used to. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've always been reflective and critical. You do? Well, yeah. you never let me know. <laughs> okay. Um, is that a new turn? Or, I mean, no, you've said that's always been there, but when you say you want to work on your own, does it mean you want to, more, to work in a more integrated way than just as a team member? You know I am mean? I'm, 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 I've been working on a long-term project on, on theory, dealing with the theory of nature, of the human environment, if you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I want to devote more time to that, mm -hmm. increasingly, over the next, uh, well, I, I've been working on it now for six, seven years, but mm -hmm. very sporadically. Yes. And I want to put in more time and and that I can after an initial attempt to do that in a joint collective way mm -hmm. I decided I just have to do it by myself <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I want to ask you one last question Bob. It's this as you look to the future what is the thing you fear most and what is the thing you hope most <laughs> what are the grounds for your greatest pessimism and what are the grounds for your greatest optimism yeah well, um, ooh, the, 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 that's a very tricky question because one of the problems I have is that I'm basically an optimist. Long-term optimist. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's a safe yeah. place to be. Yeah. And, and no, but I, but I tend to respond to all personal situations in an and optimistic why that? light. Because you've had some hard knocks. I mean, yes. You yeah. see, why, yeah. why are you an optimist? Yeah, I don't. I don't uh, uh, maybe because I survive pretty well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, I know a little bit about early childhood education, and I can't explain it at all myself. <laughs> um, but, but whatever it is, it's, it's very clear. And, and like with most of my biases, I always try to bend over backwards to cope with them. Yes. So I keep making lists <laughs> of all the reasons to be pessimistic. Right. <laughs> And 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 um, um, uh, so forth. I I guess the um, I guess the I guess the thing I fear most um, is probably a loss of hope or a loss of idealism. And I haven't said this to myself. This is the first no, time. No, but, but I, I just said it now. Um, um, I think uh, I see. I see. That there's so many signs around us of 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 um, a with good reason for a, a, we're obviously entering the age of limits, 
um, in which the simply the upward and onward uh, from the cave in terms of growth and material things will be much restrained. There's a widespread cynicism about every one of our um, um, institutions. There's a very strong, you can debate whether it's simply a turn to privatism or, or narcissism. Um, uh, and um, um, I worry about people who can't strike a good balance between their collective hopes and aspirations and their private hopes and aspirations. I think it's that um, uh, mix, as you know, I'm a very strong family person. Yes. It's a very important part of my life, but it's obviously over the long thrust of time we have to extend that same familism to a much larger family um, in the world. And I worry about young people uh, growing up, never uh, becoming premature cynics, mm -hmm. yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, um, as opposed to skeptics, which are healthy things. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's my, my um, um, biggest wor worry. Right. Uh -huh. Yes. And, uh, and what is the grounds for the continuing your optimism? Oh, I think there's lots of grounds for, for, for continuing um, um, optimism. The, uh, uh, the, uh, um, as, first of all, as I go down my list of catastrophes, I find, uh, first of all, I find very few global, real, truly global catastrophes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most of them are regional. Mm -hmm. And while they may cause enormous suffering, um, I find none of them are globally convincing. I think nature is much more resilient and much, uh -huh. is much less fragile mm -hmm. than we give credit for. Uh -huh. um, um, I think that uh, we, we have this ironic situation um, that we have uh, healthy doomsayers among us. Uh, we listen to them partly. We create corrective motions, and then we say, see how stupid our doomsayers are. They're wrong. <laughs> 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 and I think that process helps um, yes. Um, 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 will help save us. Um, I think just by the odds of, of a species, we've got some time to run. <laughs> um, That's a good. So I'm uh, for my granddaughters. Mm -hmm. uh, time. I'm still optimistic. Wonderful, and I think this is a good note on which to end our conversation. I want to thank you so much, Bob, and look forward to seeing the next chapter of a very interesting story. Yeah, well, it's been you. nice. To, it, it's um, uh, and when I left, uh, Ellie s said, uh, "You might find some questions raised, uh, really important questions." And I have. <laughs> good, good, Bob. Well, thank you very much.